One and a half minutes seems like nothing, right? What could you possibly do in 90 seconds? Maybe make a coffee, ponder over a distant memory, or subscribe to true crime stories. But what if I told you that a family went from peaceful to bereaved in those short but life-altering moments? 18-year-old Kyle Farisian, a high schooler and gamer, was over the moon about getting a new job at a local convenience store in his area. But sadly, Kyle's first and only job became his last one when his badly injured body was found engulfed in flames inside the 7-Eleven where he worked. Everyone from Kyle's family to the community of Punta Gorda and even the police were left in a state of grief and shock. They have too many questions and no answers. The tragic case of 18-year-old Kyle Farisian is horrific, mind-boggling, and really leaves you wondering where danger could be lurking. It could be creeping up on you. It could be right in front of you. And sometimes, Danger can catch you off guard at the worst times. Welcome to True Crime Stories. If you're sick of those annoying AI-narrated true crime channels, well, I post new true crime cases every single week hosted by a live human person. So if you want to see some classic true crime documentaries, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free and will keep you up to date with all of my future videos. Kyle J. Farisian was born on March 17, 1997 in Naples, Florida. He came from a blended family that included his stepdad and several stepbrothers and sisters, and Kyle was close with every last one of them. He loved riding his bike, exploring the outdoors, and keeping himself busy with adventures. He was also an avid gamer, and he was overall a happy, friendly, and welcoming young man. Kyle's personality was very warm and polite, but he was also very protective of his sister, Kesta. The siblings shared a mutual love for biking and would always go together everywhere. Kyle, being the overprotective brother, always looked out for his sister, and he ensured that no danger ever reached him, always keeping tabs on him. Kyle, even though he loved his stepfamily, also kept in touch with his biological dad, Mark Farisian, who lived about 50 miles away in Punta Gorda. Mark defined Kyle as his best friend. Kyle got into a comfortable routine of spending the weekdays with his dad in Punta Gorda, and then the weekends with his new family. In 2015, Kyle was living in Punta Gorda, and he was attending high school in North Fort Myers as well. Like most high schoolers, Kyle also got his very first job around that time. It was at a local 7-Eleven in Punta Gorda, and lucky for Kyle, it was the night shift. And this was great news for Kyle because he could not only get a grip on his new work life, but he could also build his confidence and try to interact with people more easily, as there would be far fewer people coming in at night. So by all accounts, this job was perfect for Kyle because he was not only happy with the shift hours, but he was also getting his first taste of freedom and financial independence, which is something that a lot of high schoolers look forward to. But no one could have anticipated that Kyle's first job ever would turn out to be his last, because in the early hours of November 1st, 2015, Kyle was subjected to something so utterly evil and life-altering that it would haunt his family forever. October 31st, 2015 started out like any other day for Kyle. It was Halloween, and Kyle went about his day like normal, and later after midnight, he had to go to 7-Eleven for his shift on November 1st of 2015. Kyle was supposed to clock in on his own at first, and then later, at around 3.30 a.m., he'd be joined by another coworker. So Kyle got dressed and made his way to 7-Eleven for his shift. Things were moving slowly, and customers were steadily flowing in, and Kyle was at the register serving them as well as keeping an eye on the aisles. At around 7.13 a.m., just 13 minutes before Kyle's coworker was scheduled to clock in for work and join him, a 911 call was made by a local resident. According to the caller, smoke was seen billowing out of the 7-Eleven, and fire was visible from inside the store. As the woman on the phone approached the scene, she made an eerie discovery. She could clearly see a body on the floor, and after this revelation, emergency services were immediately dispatched to 7-Eleven. As soon as the fire was extinguished, the first responders could definitely see a badly burned body by the counter. But that wasn't all. The floor leading to the counter was stained with blood. And upon a closer inspection of the body, there were multiple wounds. This left the investigators confused. Their first thought was arson. 
But now, this seemed even more sinister and disturbing. Someone had deliberately taken the life of a 7-Eleven worker and then set the place on fire. But remember the co-worker that was due to start her shift soon? Well, it turns out she was right outside the convenience store and about to go in when she saw the fire inside. Panicked, she immediately ran and rang Kyle, as she knew that he was the only one working at that time. But sadly, Kyle wasn't picking up the phone, and her fears turned into solid and inexplicable dread. The co-worker also reached out to the investigators at the crime scene, and she broke down in tears, admitting that the burned body found inside 7-Eleven was likely that of 18-year-old Kyle Farija. It's so devastating to think that Kyle had just started this new job. He was excited for this new change in his life, and now he was gone, and the way that he passed was just so insane and brutal. The detectives were now left with two daunting tasks. The first was to inform Kyle's family of his passing, and the second was to find out who was behind this heinous attack. News broke out immediately about the fire in 7-Eleven, and Kyle's parents were informed of their son's terrible and untimely passing. Everyone was crestfallen and horrified. Kyle's parents couldn't believe what they were hearing. Kyle had just walked out the door a few hours prior, and they were expecting him to come home the next day. But they were made aware of the harsh truth that their happy, cheerful, and adventurous Kyle was gone. Kyle's sister, Keston, was understandably inconsolable. Kyle was her savior, her protector, a brother who always looked out for his sister. And now he was so savagely taken away from her. It's so tragic and senseless. Crimes like these are always hard for the police, too, because what looked like one thing quickly turned into something else and a very sinister crime. Because this was no accidental fire. It was definitely a homicide. And now the investigators had to find out who did it. Kyle was an 18-year-old boy in high school. He didn't have any enemies or people who despised him. He was a helpful and caring person. So who did this to Kyle? Was there someone who loathed Kyle and wanted to lash out at him in the worst possible way? Was it a random fight at 7-Eleven that escalated badly? The detectives were left with a mountain of questions and no clues, so they had no choice but to start from ground zero, and that was to analyze the CCTV footage from the night before. In the meantime, the police also announced an $11,000 reward for any information or witnesses on the night of the crime and what could have happened to Kyle. The investigators wanted to see who was there on the night of the crime, and if anyone was acting suspiciously. So the police started to ask around. They asked locals, other 7-Eleven employees, and even managers. They even reached out to people who visited the convenience store around the time of the crime. The detectives first reached out to the woman who made the 911 call. Her name was Chelsea, and interestingly, she left the scene shortly after calling the investigators. And this didn't sit right with the authorities. But Chelsea was soon crossed off the suspect list because her reasoning for leaving was valid. Chelsea, when being interviewed by the police, stated that she and her boyfriend went to buy some cigarettes from 7-Eleven. But before they could make it to the reception, they were horrified by the fire and the blood in front of them. The couple immediately ran out and they called the police. Now, when Chelsea was asked why she left the scene, she said that she was genuinely afraid that the perpetrator might still be out there or that the fire would get out of control, so they fled for their safety. Even the investigators didn't buy this story at first, but they were convinced when Chelsea's boyfriend also corroborated the story. The detectives therefore concluded that the couple was telling the truth, and there's no real reason for them to lie to save their skin. And who could blame them? A situation like this is terrifying. The police then turned their attention to the CCTV cameras, and they were relieved to find that some of them were still in working condition as we all know that this is rarely ever the case, especially after a fire, but with a stroke of luck, two cameras in particular caught something very significant. See, the detectives analyzed the first camera, and even though the footage was very blurry, they could make out most of what was happening. At around 3.12 a.m., just a couple minutes before Kyle will be joined by his other co-worker, the police saw Kyle walking down the aisle, seemingly looking at someone. Within a few seconds, a figure emerged from the third aisle, a mysterious man was seen holding a gasoline can. His face was covered, and he had a hood over his head, so the investigators couldn't quite make out who it was. But what the detectives saw next was truly horrific. The masked man, while facing Kyle, 
pulled out a weapon and fired at Kyle at point blank range. The man then fired again and poured gasoline all around the scene. The man was then seen grabbing a lighter from one of the display shelves, then set fire to the gasoline before running out of the door. It was so inhumane and brutal and seemingly unprovoked. The officers couldn't do anything but sit in horrific silence as they were trying to process what they had just witnessed. The police also went through the second camera, and luckily it was a much clearer recording with an audio recording attached to it. It showed that the mysterious man had walked into the store at 3.11 a.m. The man didn't converse with Kyle, and he was seen walking around. The only sound that was heard were the two shots that rang out into the night. After reviewing the footage again, the only noteworthy detail that stood out to investigators was that the man was walking with a limp the whole time that he was there. The second camera also gave a very clear picture of what the man and his general build looked like. Shockingly, the man was wearing latex gloves, and at one point, the footage caught him taking one of the gloves off. The man was also wearing camo pants and carried a red gasoline can. According to the surveillance footage, the masked man was only in the store for less than two minutes, and he launched such a brutal attack on Kyle in that very short amount of time without so much as saying a single word to him. It's so hard to wrap your head around to the fact that so much can change within a few short minutes. Regardless, the police finally had their suspect. They knew that the masked man was the person behind Kyle's brutal passing. But there was one problem. The detectives had no idea who this man was. His face was covered, and no details could be made out. There was also no incriminating evidence, save a discarded and melted latex glove found near Kyle's body. So the investigators were left with no choice but to ask locals for more information about this man. During the investigation, though, there was a breakthrough. See, the manager of 7-Eleven, the same store where Kyle worked, reached out to the detectives with some information. It was a bizarre coincidence that the manager wanted the police to know about, which took place weeks before the tragic and sudden attack on Kyle. But she believed she may know who the criminal was. The 7-Eleven manager, Lori, remembered a very peculiar scene that occurred weeks before the heinous crime. She recalled a man walking into 7-Eleven to buy alcohol. Lori and Kyle were both there when the man approached the counter. At the register, Lori requested the man's ID that he only showed from his wallet. When she asked him to remove it from his wallet so that she could scan it, that was when the man lashed out at her. He refused to hand over his ID, and Chelsea therefore refused to serve him. The man seemingly got very violent, and he proceeded to threaten Chelsea with taking her job away, and also asked for every employee's name working there before angrily walking out the door. Lori tried to note down the violent man's license plate to report him to the authorities, but when the man saw her doing that, he followed her back inside the store. Intimidation, aggression, and anger clear in his stride. He began to cause a scene, and it was getting very intense, and this was the moment when Kyle called 911, and the man noticed that. Before the investigators could arrive, though, the man zipped out of the parking lot, but Lori had successfully noted down the license plate number. When the police arrived, Lori handed the details over to the detectives, and he was banned from entering the store. Since the man didn't show up again, Lori, as well as the investigators, thought that he was just an angry man flying off the handle. But a couple of weeks later, on September 15, 2015, the same man came back in for some alcohol, and the employees refused to serve him for obvious reasons. The police were called again, and the man fled the scene once again. Now, hearing all of this, especially after the tragic and fatal attack on Kyle, the police finally decided to look into this mysterious and angry customer. The license plates were registered under the name of Michael Russo, a 28-year-old resident who actually lived quite close to the local 7-Eleven. He was also given a trespass warning in September when he came by 7-Eleven a second time. The investigators played both footages side by side, and they found very alarming similarities between the two men. Their suspicions were solidified when they received a tip from someone who lived near the store. See, the footage and other details of the masked man were made public, as to help solve Kyle's case quickly and efficiently. According to the man who gave the tip, his neighbor had the same limp in his step as the man in the CCTV footage. When the detectives looked further into the neighbor, it was found that he was none other than Michael Russo. 
With a solid suspect in sight, the only thing that was left to do was catch this Michael Russo guy. But it wasn't going to be easy. So the police spent months building a strong case against Michael to get a warrant. They even asked people around the area who Michael was. According to a lot of people and even his neighbors, Michael was a loner and a callous man who was angry at the world. His mother, Maria, tragically ended her own life in 2011, and a year later, his father, Michael Russo Sr., went on to do the same. Michael was a quiet guy who never went outside or interacted with anyone, but he had an extensive gun collection, and according to his neighbors, his favorite was a long-barreled revolver, which looked awfully similar to the one that was seen by investigators in the footage. Michael was also defined as a very violent man who would accuse anyone and everyone of bizarre and meaningless things. So the police had enough evidence to apply for a search warrant, and that's exactly what they did. Not long after this tip, the detectives paid Michael Russo a visit, and when his place was searched, the evidence they found was shocking. First of all, his house was littered with firearms of all kinds, and horrifically, all of them were loaded. The investigators also found a box of latex gloves that matched the lone glove that was found at the crime scene. Moreover, there was a lot of gasoline cans in Michael's garage, and get this, they were all the same as the ones seen in the footage by police. But there was one more thing the police found. Michael's car was also searched for any evidence, and even though there was nothing found that stood out to investigators, just as they were about to exit the car, something on the driver's side door handle caught their eye. It was a single, tiny speck of blood right by the door handle. The police took all of these things in as evidence, and after five long and grueling months, the police finally arrested Michael Russo on suspicion of ending Kyle's life on April 6th of 2016. Now, the investigators had only one thing to ask Michael, and that was, why? Why did he attack Kyle? What was the motive? Michael and Kyle didn't even know each other, and apart from the unpleasant encounters at 7-Eleven, where the employees refused to serve him alcohol, there was no other reason for Michael to make Kyle go through such a painful ordeal. According to the police, Michael was resentful, and he had meticulously planned everything from the get-go, from the way the crime panned out to covering his tracks by covering his face and hands. He had intentions to kill, but it could have been anyone. And sadly, on November 1st, Kyle was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and Michael made him, a young, defenseless 18-year-old, his target of violence. Well, Michael was still the uncooperative man that he was known to be, and he refused to come out with any details as to why he did what he did. Infuriatingly, Michael also pleaded not guilty to the charges of second-degree homicide and first-degree arson, and he was due to await trial. On June 18th of 2017, nearly two years after the tragic passing of Kyle, Michael's trial was held. The prosecution was confident that the evidence against Michael, even though it was all circumstantial, was strong, and they would be able to get him to face the consequences for what he did to Kyle. Michael's defense, on the other hand, stressed that there was no physical evidence against Michael, and the absence of his DNA at the crime scene proved that he didn't commit the crime. But that isn't even true, and it was clear that Michael's team were grasping at straws. The jury deliberated, and Michael Russo was found guilty of all charges. On July 17th of 2017, almost a month after the trial, Michael was sentenced to life in prison for second-degree murder, along with an additional 30 years for first-degree arson. His attorneys did file a motion for a new trial, but there haven't been any developments in this regard as of present. It's safe to say that Michael will likely stay behind bars for the rest of his life. Kyle's funeral was held on November 15th of 2015 and he was laid to rest with hundreds of people in attendance. His family, friends, and neighbors all gathered around to say their final goodbyes to a funny and bright young man who had his whole life ahead of him. Kyle was a fan of old and vintage cars, and his casket was transported in his favorite Ford pickup truck. He was laid to rest in Charlotte Memorial Gardens in Punta Gorda, Florida. Kyle was a wonderful and helpful young man who didn't have a bad bone in his body. He was simply doing his job, a job that he was so excited about and a monster with a grudge that led him to commit the unthinkable drove Kyle to his very tragic and sudden end without any reason. It seems very clear this man was simply disturbed. Six weeks after Kyle's demise, the Charlotte community got together to remember Kyle in the best way. Sure, everyone was sad beyond imagination, and the Frisian family weren't anywhere near moving on with their lives after such a horrific change, 
but they wanted to remember Kyle the way that he would have wanted everyone to. The Punta Gorda and Port Charlotte community came together and celebrated Kyle's life with food, music, and showing their support for the grieving Parisian family. Blake Zen, the owner of a local eatery, Porky's Roadhouse, arranged for food, manpower, and services for eight music bands that played and entertained the community on a Sunday afternoon. A lot of donations were made at that time as well to help Kyle's grief-stricken family and to help find Kyle's killer should the investigation need additional funding or resources. Kyle Farisian was a happy and helpful young man who became a victim of violence and anger projected by someone who didn't even know him to begin with. Michael was a bitter and angry monster of a person who just wanted to inflict pain and violence on anyone that he could find. And sadly, Kyle was the innocent man who unknowingly crossed paths with someone who drove him straight into the hands of death. To think that such a simple, ordinary, and unremarkable evening could turn into this, it's beyond understanding. We can only hope that Kyle's family, including his parents and siblings, can hold on to the good and everlasting memories of Kyle and try to move on from this tragedy because neither Kyle nor his family deserved what they went through. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Christine Smith and Cordelia Garnett. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you'll gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public. And it's currently the best way you can support the channel and help out. And I really appreciate those of you that have decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link down in the description. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.